Hey, I'm Nancy Cavey. I'm an ERISA and individual disability attorney, and I want to welcome you to Winning Isn't Easy. Before we get started, I've got to give you a legal disclaimer. The Florida Bar tells me that I have to tell you that this podcast is not legal advice. However, I will tell you that nothing will ever stop me from giving you an easy to understand overview of the disability insurance world, the games that disability carriers play, and what you need to know to get the disability benefits you deserve. Ready? Now, I know making the decision to reduce your hours and apply for residual disability benefits or to make the difficult decision to stop work completely and apply for total disability benefits can be tough. I watched my dad make this decision many years and he agonized over it. It took him a couple years to finally decide that he was going to stop work and apply for his benefits. Now, you may think that once you've made that decision and you filed your disability insurance application, that your first disability check is going to be FedEx to you overnight, just within hours of you applying for your benefits. Well, I know your doctor supports your claim and maybe your employer supports your claim, but I will tell you that's not the way it happens. Disability carriers are going to be reviewing your application from three different perspectives. The first is, what are the terms of your policy or plan that are applicable to your claim? Secondly, what's the sufficiency of the medical proof that establishes that you're disabled as that term is defined by your policy or plan? And your occupation, as that term is also defined by your policy or plan? And whether or not you're unable to perform the material and substantial duties of that occupation. In this multi-part series, I have been talking about occupational factors. I've already covered the topics of what your specific occupational duties were prior to the onset of disability, what were the specific uh, mental and physical requirements associated with each and every duty, how long you performed each one of these duties in the course of an average day or week, how the disability carrier goes about verifying your occupational duties, how important the date of onset is as it relates to what your occupation was, the status of your license, the results of those data base and social media searches that the disability carrier and plan are going to do, the results of the criminal background checks that they are going to do, and the results of their unemployment uh, background check that they have done on you. A lot of background work, isn't it? But today, I want to switch Um, topics a little bit, a little focus difference. What we're going to talk about today is, do you have a job to return to? Are there situational factors that impact your motivation to return to work? And these are the kind of stupid questions that the carrier is going to ask you when you apply for benefits. And I want to give you an example of how one disability carrier rejected a claim and was ultimately overturned by a disability carrier. And this disability disabled policyholder had scheduled electroshock treatments and the disability carrier claimed that that was to bolster their claim when the position was eliminated. So we've got some great topics to talk about today. Before we start in, let's take a short break. Welcome back to Winning Isn't Easy. In the last segment, I mentioned that one of the questions you might get is, is your job being eliminated? I'm going to tell you the story about how a disability carrier denied benefits on the basis that the disabled policyholder scheduled, purposely scheduled electroshock treatments to bolster their disability claim because they knew their position was being eliminated. This is the case of Cheryl versus Sun Life. It's a case out of uh, the Chicago area, and it's literally shocking. Cheryl suffered from depression, anxiety, panic disorder, and agoraphobia throughout her career as a research coordinator at the University of Chicago. And in early 2020, her psychiatric problems worsened to the point where electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, was recommended. Simultaneously with this, Um, she was advised that her position was being terminated in several months due to the lack of funding. 
She, of course, filed a claim for her disability insurance benefits based on her psychiatric condition and scheduled the ECT treatment as recommended by her physicians. Now, Sun Life, who was a disability carrier, denied the claim, and this case ultimately ended up in front of a federal judge. Sun Life took the position that she wasn't totally disabled because she had managed her psychiatric condition for the last 10 years, and she would have likely in their estimation, continued her job had her position not been terminated. And the court took issue with the idea that Sun Life floated, that the timing of this claim was based on an ulterior motive. I mean, doesn't everybody have electroconvulsive therapy treatment just to file a claim for disability benefits? Now, the judge, as I is indicated, was not happy with Sun Life. They cherry-picked the medical records. And fortunately for Cheryl, the judge was able to review this case under a de novo standard of review, which means that they got to review the record and, and uh, could substitute their own judgment from that of, the, of uh, Sun Life. Now, um, the judge said, look, I'm looking at these medical records, and I can see that her psychiatric condition was clearly deteriorating in the months prior to the announcement of the position being terminated and agreed with the assessment of her treating physicians that she was disabled uh, and needed to undergo those electroconvulsive therapy treatments. The court commented that it would be extraordinarily improbable that Cheryl's physician, physicians perceived and recommended, perceived that she needed them and recommended the EC treatment solely for the purposes of bolstering her disability claim. That kind of treatment, the court noted, is only reserved for severe psychiatric conditions when less effective treatments have been uh, uh, tried and have been unsuccessful. So this is a pretty darn significant type of treatment. And the judge recognized that. The judge awarded her benefits and dismissed Sun Life's bogus reasons for the claims denial. So can you see now how a disability carrier or a plan is gonna use any reason to deny a claim? I hope you've enjoyed this week's episode of Winning Isn't Easy. If you've enjoyed this episode, consider liking our page, leaving a review, or sharing it with your friends and family. Please subscribe to the podcast. That way you're going to be notified every time that a new episode comes out. I hope you tune in next week for another insightful episode of Winning Isn't Easy.